Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful evening of poetry and po prose reading with the Windfall Reading Series. My name is Wendy, and I work at the Eugene Public Library. Hello, everyone. Um, and we are going to have a couple of great readers tonight, and I'm so glad you could join us. A few quick things. A couple people to thank, a couple groups. The Lane Literary Guild, of course, we could not have this program without them and their expertise and their passion for good reading and good writing. And, and I'm very pleased to have, um, have this show, this performance for, with them in mind. And with that in mind, I'm going to put out their address. So please go online, take a look at what they have to offer. Um, wonderful support of the arts, creator of the arts in Lane County, and we're so glad that they're here. Um, I also wanted to thank the friends of the Eugene Public Library. They support us in so many ways. They fundraise, they do so many things to make sure we can have a variety of programs, from children's, young adult, adult programs, etc. So thank you to the friends of the Eugene Public Library for your um, promotion, for your service, and for your wonderfulness. Um, a couple ways you can ask questions of the authors. We are going to have a Q&A at the end of the reading. Um, you are welcome to include questions right at the um, bottom of the screen. There's a way to include comments and please feel free to do so. Um, we will read them at the end. You can also email me if you prefer and let me put up a new little banner for that. If you feel a little shy and don't wanna put something up on YouTube, totally fine. Um, feel free to email me at this address here and I will monitor my email and I'll be glad to read your question at the end as well. So please do email me and um, we can ask our authors the questions that are burning in your mind. So with that in mind, let me introduce, get rid of that banner, introduce um, Henry Alley of the Lane Literary Guild and I'll bring him to the fore here. Hello, Henry. Hi, Wendy. It's a delight to be here tonight and to represent the Windfall series for Lane Writers, uh, for Lane Literary Guild, also our lanewriters.org, um, and which, as Wendy said, we encourage you to, to investigate and see not only what Lane uh, Literary Guild does, but what, what is happening in terms of the literary activity um, throughout uh, our county here. Um, I want to just mention that the Lane Literary Guild has been around since 1984. Um, I was there when uh, we first got started. Uh, for one of our first readings was with William Stafford. And it's been a remarkable journey ever since to hear over time, over these many years, uh, such wonderful writers in our area. And also we've brought some from uh, outside our area as well. Uh, we we also have supported writers uh, workshops and we've supported contests and it's just it's just very nice to see how the lane literary guild has evolved over time uh, tonight we have two wonderful writers uh, amber flame and also mike van matkin we have I have heard both of them read, have had the privilege of hearing them both of them read, and just said to myself, oh, I hope that we can get them into this series because their writing is so remarkable. So the, the first uh, we're going to hear from is Amber Flame, our poet. Uh, Amber Flame is an interdisciplinary artist, writer, activist, and educator whose work has garnered residencies with Hedgebrook, The Watering Hole, Vermont Studio Center, and Y-E-F-E-N-O-F. -E -E a former church kid from the Southwest, Flame's work has been published in diverse arenas, including Def Jam Poetry, Nailed Magazine, Winter Tangerine, The Dialogist, Split This Rock, Black Heart Magazine, Sundress Publications, Freeze Ray, Redivider Journal, and more. In her writing, Flame explores spirituality and sexuality, cross-woven with themes of grief and loss, motherhood and magic, and the interstitial joy of it in it all. A 2016 and 2017 Push Prior, Pushcart Prize nominee and Jack Straw Writer Program alum, Amber's Flame, Amber Flame's first full-length poetry collection, Ordinary Cruelty, 
was published in 2017 through Right Bloody Press. Flame was a recipient of the City Artist Grant from Seattle's Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs to write, produce, and perform her one-person play, Hands Above the Covers, a series of character monologues drawn from diverse real-life interviews. In early 2018, Flame co-curated the art installation Black Imagination at Core Gallery in Seattle. She had her first solo exhibit in 2019 with an exhibit entitled Intrigue 8, a multimedia installation that featured musical compositions inspired by the text of eight different poets with original video content, as well as text from the original poems through Jack Straw Productions, artist support, and new media gallery fellowships. Hugo House's 2017 to 2019 Writer in Residence for Poetry, Flame's second book of poetry entitled Apocryphia, is forthcoming from Red Hin Press. Recently named program director of Hitchbrook, she continues to work as a writing instructor and serves to offer programming for currently and formerly incarcerated women and youth through her work with the IF program while working on a third collection, remounting her full-length play, working on a few nonfiction anthologies, and raising her daughter. Amber Flame is a queer black mama, just one magic trick away from growing her unicorn horn. And I want to say just personally, uh, she and I read with a series of, of writers up in Portland, well, actually it was virtual, but it came out of Portland in the Insight series, a literary series, which was a, a, a queer reading series. And when I heard her poem on, with the theme of Aretha Franklin, I thought, my goodness, I'm not clean out of the park. This is remarkable. Um, and then later I thought, I hope for sure we can get her wonderful poetry into this series. Um, and this, this is a poem where we have uh, what is called a vanguard short poem, followed by three long po longer poems, all on the theme of Aretha Franklin. And there are, of course, other remarkable poems she'll be reading tonight. But an example from her Aretha Franklin poem uh, comes, she heated now, ran those notes too high to be believed, and now she's all glistening skin and mouth open wide, enough for the whole world inside, but most of all for herself. Without further ado, I will now introduce Amber Flame. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Henry, for having me. And thank you, Eugene Library and the Lane Literary Guild. Um, you all now know everything about my life. I didn't realize it was gonna be the full bio or I would have submitted a shorter one. Um, thank you so much, Henry, for inviting me here. And I'm excited to share with you some more poems, including the Aretha Suite. Um, I'm going to start with some poems from my book called Ordinary Cruelty. Um, I have found that over the last several years, I've been exploring that those things that haunt us, those things that stay with us, um, everything from uh, fruits and vegetables, which I have a particular, particular fondness for, to um, celebrities and icons who pass and leave us marked forever by their presence. Um, so I'm going to start with a poem about the aftermath because that's what I write about apparently. <laughs> this is called, If You Look Out Your Left Window, You Can See the Detonation Site. I want to tell you about the aftermath because it doesn't matter so much what happened, what counts are the days you walk around like a desecrated tomb, all open mouth and body absent. When you are left sweeping up the detritus of your sacred because the riches are gone and they've left you only a mess. I want to tell about the aftermath, the nights you come bumping back into your itching skin only to find your arms are aching from holding yourself together. You have nothing, nothing to help you through the countdown to inevitable eyelid droop. The nights when success means that you didn't call for confirmation, that you truly are the barren wasteland they've already chosen not to love. I want to tell you about love's ugly, when it's twisted and broken, when you are a mess. Tell about the aftermath, not about what they did, but about how you find yourself parked outside their house in the rain, just so you can ask for them to come back to you. This is embarrassing. Just so you can see who they've replaced you with, how they aren't better than you were before you became this mess. How the next day you find your car is a crime scene, 
There is blood on the seats and your heart is unfortunately still thumping wetly against the floor mat where you wedged it under the brake pedal. I want to tell about the mess you make of yourself for love, the little compromises and pieces you shaved off to fit their desire, how you find them curled like dead skin on the floor of your empty house and you forget how to fill the space around you. Tell about the aftermath cataloging of everything you never liked in them anyway so you could wish you were the strong one you were the one to walk away I want to tell you how it saps your bones of the marrow the absence of their breath in the night is blowing lonely on the empty reeds how with a body this hollow you should be allowed flight but you are grounded here in your mess and so you sweep 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 Hmm. The Daily Grind. You were powdered sugar ground. No place to sit or lay ground. You are toddler, no tiara ground. Mortal and pestle ground. You done met a hard place, a rock and a soft spot. Still ain't no place to lay your head. And it won't hide you neither, nor hair. You are ground down, ground around, profound ground. And you figure that with a hole it's wearing in you. You gotta be wearing a hole in it. And you you wonder if when you get that hole, if you'll be too ground down to see it through. Smell my defeat. Lately, I am working most at forgiving the failings of the body, my body specifically. I have to breathe deep through the hints of a double chin and recommit to push-ups when I notice my skin laying wrinkled and loose, but it is the me that bothers me most with its inclination to buckle and inability to kneel. This is a dangerous and precarious position to take. There is give and pain and submit and pain and a proclivity for it all. I wonder if I could forgive such a large failing, a hindrance in a lover, if I'd compromise lovemaking positions to accommodate an ailment, a permanent injury, an acknowledged falling apart. I think this is perhaps a large part of why I don't date. There is give and pain and commit and pain and an attachment to watching it all go. The knee becomes a theme. It turns out that I do indeed have a bad knee. I seem to write poems about it. Another theme that comes up often is my daughter. Um, this is one of my favorite poems I think I've written for her. And it's called An Octopus Escapes the Fishing Net. Advice for my daughter as cephalopod. In this life where you must be both predator and delicacy, rend for yourself the tenderest bits. Enter a world, daughter, where you may drink brine and not be pickled. Lose remorse in the hunt for that which feeds you. Be sure there are eight passions for each arm's embrace in case your dreams are injured or cut short. By all means, keep yourself whole, even as you adapt with grace. Honey love, my sinuous structure, pure musculature and give, infinite flex and reshaping. Do not be confined to any that would contain you. Be gentle, relentless manipulation. Hang on, love, or disappear in the confusion of your melanin clouding the display. How they love to watch you squirm and ooze. Be not object, entertainment. Remember how to pry open exits. Remember camouflage. Learn both lurk and listen. Eyes open to color of danger, of safety. Do not forget that tucked up in the unfurling of your pretty petticoat of a body, you are thought and plot, beak and brain, predator and delicacy. Feed. So this first book of mine was um, definitely written about the mother body, um, my mother's body as I was losing her as she died. Um, tragically in, in the poems I wrote as I processed that grief, but also the grief of losing yourself and being a mother, um, the joy in losing yourself and being a mother, um, what it means to have your body um, give way to another being. And um, 
I went on in my work, which I'm going to share some of my newer poems um, after this one, went on to explore the ghosts that sort of linger um, from our experiences. And this last year, <clears throat> if nothing else, this last year has taught us um, to examine where we grieve and, and mourn and to find ways to thrive and experience joy despite that. So this is one of the poems I wrote for my mother. Um, I think maybe my first ghost poem. Resurrection or unresolved abandonment issues when your mother dies. Tell the one where she comes back just to leave you again. Tell the one where she was not gone anymore. Tell the one where she is here again by magic. Tell the one where she is crunch, crunch, crunching, shovel, scrape. Tell the one where she is back by DNA reconstruction from a piece of you, Amber. Tell the one where she is sand, castle you build from ashes. Tell the one where she is not ever gone. Tell that one again and again and believe it. Tell the one where she turns blue, then gray, then collapses. Tell the one where she turns blue, then gray, then collapses. Tell the one where she turns blue, then gray, then collapses. Tell the one where she is back by human sacrifice. Tell the one where she blames you and is not wrong, but is still gone. Tell the one where she comes back just to leave you again. Hmm. Grief uh, just becomes different over time, I think. Not easier, just different. Um, the newest manuscript that I'm working on is uh, called The Ghost Formerly Known as Prince and Other Hauntings. Um, Other Hauntings for short. And I'd like to share a couple pieces from that. This one's called Bedfellow. How do you kiss a ghost? What kind of mouth meets your hot breath? Can you say no ghost? No thank you. How do you friend zone a spirit determined to want you, demanding your attention, even if only when you finally sleep? What door do you lock? What clothes don't ask for it? Is there any agency in submission to a haunting? Or must you lay in wait, trying not to flinch? But you flinch, even when you hear it coming. Boo. Oh, on becoming your best self. Check your words at the door of your mouth. Make your mouth a door if it was previously a swinging gate or if it was previously a vined archway. Make your mouth a door that can shut and lock or if it was previously a threshold or steps or a steep cliff. Heaven help you if it was open, if it was wide, if it was hungry. You're going to learn to build doors, containers with lids, things that shut that seal, that are quiet sometimes, when being quiet is the easiest path to choose. See how love first made you your best self, like a habit, like a calling, like a muscle exercising? Get strong, get better, get lucky sometimes, but more, get patient, how it serves you, how it flatters you, how it becomes you. In Whole Foods, buying myself a cake on a Tuesday, an older white man stops me to say thank you. Thank you, he says, grasping my upper arm without permission. I am confused. It was certainly not my intention to help this person until he says, firefighters saved my home in this year's wildfires. Because I make a habit of not explaining to white men, I will tell you what I didn't tell him. I am not a firefighter. I am a poet with a bad knee. We regularly look like a family of superheroes, decked out in authentic firefighter off-duty swag. Three women and the progeny. A fearless wrangling of swarms of children day after relentless day. But we can have as much official gear as we want in any size. As long as her husband answers the call in the middle of the night, 10 minutes into her morning run, while she's in the grocery store, the shower, during their son's baseball game, the twins' birthday party, at her mother's funeral. Hero makes a great absentee father and husband just home to sleep. My sister says she is a single mother and blame the fire department for eventual divorce. 
Kiro will not help every day. <sighs> so I started this new form of a sort. Um, I'm calling Vanguard poems. And they are essentially a short poem that kind of sets a tone or a theme, followed by three connected poems. And I'm, I'm still trying it out. I'm exploring with it, but I'm really, really happy with some of the things that have come from it, including the Aretha Suite. So I'm going to read the, the full Vanguard Aretha Suite. It starts with, Miss Franklin says nothing. You learn quick what sins will be forgiven and which you'll have to bear, birth, and raise when you are a girl child in your daddy's church. In your daddy's church, a girl child is groomed, wants to be found ready, is available after services for extra prayer, believes when he says girl child needs counsel, needs guidance, needs a wedding before belly swells, or maybe just a vacation, nine months off Sunday sermons. A girl child in your daddy's church can sing Precious Lord, can play, can hum, can wail about amazing grace, but no one hears her speak. Number one, in an alternate world, Aretha Franklin is just a black girl in public school. Ree showed up for kindergarten in rhinestone tap shoes, said her father was out of town preaching, didn't say she wouldn't take them off, but didn't. In third grade, Big Mama had to come walk sullen Aretha home, trailing feathers from the boa, said Miss Clara Ward gave it to her especially, and she'd wear it every day, meant it. By fifth grade, Miss Retha had made friends with all the boys, claimed the girls were just looking to see what she'd wear next. Her seventh grade teacher didn't care for her. Miss Franklin's report card said, watch out. This one don't say much, but does as she pleases. Number two, I bet Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. paid her first too. She approaches like it's the last demand. She's going to get met. And piano gives a certain bend to the notes when a black lady finally willing to set her purse down on it, right in her line of sight and get ready to play. Payment cash tucked neatly in leather seems ivory's most tickled by a sure thing lends a resonance when she calls out for freedom like it's been taken from her and the crowd is with her you understand when coat slides to puddle silken on stage at her feet she heated now ran those notes too high to be believed and now she's all glistening skin and mouth open wide enough for the whole world inside but most of all for herself sitting right out there on her teeth and she wouldn't have come all this way she ain't have something to wail about. Number three, estate planning. There are always things somewhere in the back of the closet no one notices until you die. You lucky if it's just a matching amber earring lost shortly after you bought the house, a broken down vibrator, a shoe long out of fashion. Miss Franklin kept her whole skin, three or four of them at least. Diva's sneer hooked over vanity mirror, loyal daughter sliding from underneath seat cushion, woman scorned, a patch job in the dark corner gathering loose sequins and feathers, fashion icon, pristinely folded and pressed, between the hats, the purses, across from the shoes, the furs. The ghost formerly known as Prince has taken residence in my left knee, dares me to twirl and do the splits, has me eyeing them cute heels, begs the feel of leather and lace. Uh, he is a mere shade of himself these days, can't spectacle like he's used to, not with, not with my knees. My knees on some retirement shit. Try to cuddle up with Prince's ghost over some hot chocolate by a fire and reminisce about the good old days. This a ghost turned melancholy quick. Every time the joint pops and creaks, tells me there are ways to forget the unbearable ache. This a specter ignores a knee's groan and click, never planned to make shadow of himself and so refuses my knee a graceful aging. Always meant to wear, not rust, says either way, you're out. Says he only did what he must to get through this thing called life. Says he never wanted to cry for pain, swear he's been changed, been reborn asks when he'll be forgiven. So the icons I wrote most about were Aretha Franklin, who um, is near and dear to my heart, and um, Prince, 
who you might you might have noticed, <laughs> and um, Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston really clung to me um, after her passing, not just because I loved her work, but something about the way she went and the way her daughter went um, the same year my mother did um, that really stuck with me. And so I write about them quite a bit in this new collection. Um, I also write about just the change that happens um, in mundane things. A perfect avocado has a shelf life of exactly five minutes. Outside these bounds, it is either unready, stringy pulp too attached to crusted skin, open precipitously, or too far gone, scooped brown softness marring the secret of its green flesh. Should you be blessed with an avocado tree in your life, all the perfect ones you pluck can never lay to rest the ghost of those wasted. My sister ripens avocado profligately, a large paper bag, an apple in its aging breath, and so many avocados, I am nervous. Guacamole does not set five minute limitations before making, just the requirement to eat it all in one sitting. Avocado more foundation than star feature. To make avocado toast, you must demand the perfection that all pale things craving melanin demand of color, no bruising, just firm resolve and an ability to give to the knife, the thumbs that come to dig goodness from the thick roughness named protection. They call it waste, return it to the earth, demand it grow again. Another Vanguard poem. This one is about my mother. Um, as sometimes happens when you lose someone, uh, you start to reconcile all the not so kind or wonderful things about them and have to forgive <laughs> in absentia, um, but also just embrace the and of them as a whole being. And I was writing some hard poems about my mother and I needed to write a kindness. So this is a vanguard called A Kindness. If mother is a myth I write in lieu of happy ending, <clears throat> let it be with kindness. Let tale be of epic proportions. Battles won with sharp blades she crafted of her own intelligence. Talking of shackles broken with sheer force of her imaginings. Wielding words into a kind of wealth, my inheritance. Allow me ancestor worship, gathering unto me her pale shade. Praise guidance found, kneel to altar, a daily offering of gifts, base mired in cement of ash and tears. One, in this poem, I am the baby. Imagine you want to die, but you have this baby, this need to feed, the squalling mouth opened. Imagine wondering if you take your ghosts with you when you go, an already dead baby in your past. Imagine knowing they will be there in your own haunting, probably this baby too, weak and dwindling. It's so hard to focus on what's not gone when you don't know how to do what's left. Imagine being called back from the humming wonder of your own death by your own unshakable sense of responsibility. Imagine every time the baby's mouth opened to cry sustenance, you survived to feed it. Two, in this poem, I am not the baby, simply someone who wanted to die alive because of a mother's guilt. Three, a wing to fly. Once, when I was eight years old, my mother spoke another language so well, she could write poetry with it. And she wrote poetry so well, the poem built a plane to carry my mother to another country. And in that other country, my mother did not need our common language for days. And so she did not use words we would understand when she took a train. She spoke with other adults only. And so I imagine, she did not think of us much at all until she returned and urged us to learn new words for ourselves. And now 
when she has no more words for me to share in any language that isn't dead. Now I practice the act of speaking freely and perhaps being understood. When I tell you I used to roller skate, do not picture the occasional special treat to roller rink, wheel grease and thin carpet, shoe spray and old hot dogs. Do not think dim rotating lights and couple skate, reverse skate, the hokey pokey. Although I mean those times too. When I say I used to roller skate, picture my mother in the living room, on the couch, facing the big window, watching as I whipped around the corner, piston thighs propelling me over broken cement straight toward her. Imagine her growing horror as I approach two fast to do anything but meet my eyes through the glass between us. Fingers clenched in anxious fists as I flew, leaping last second up the step to swerve and slam my small body to a stop against the front door. When I say I used to roller skate, I mean I wore them like shoes. Fearless bloody knees when I got up because I get up, suck the gravel from scraped palm and roll the fuck on. I'm going to read two more poems for you. Um, ah, this next one, my, my, my daughter is fond of learning about and reworking myths, Greek myths in particular, to suit her fancy um, and talks about Persephone um, a lot. And so um, it inspired this poem. It's called No Pomegranate. Lest you forget, I have already confronted death marched to the door of his very chamber and demanded my daughter. Walking away from the encounter, child in my arms is sure proof what it takes to become a god. No, ske no sneaky escape unscathed. It was a sharp knife. My organs lifted from me and piled on my chest and creation stitched together with my own flesh and sinew and blood and marrow plucked from the vine and able to breathe. And here, a thousand million years later, what I birthed maintains its own world's gravitational pull. And me, still living too, beneficent despite scar and seeping womb, to write the good book, how bang, and then life. And I'm going to end with PYT. I want my joy a bouncy bottomed young thing with more energy than I can comprehend for that which will bring me pleasure. I want debaucherous joy, sweet slippery joy, a joy that can come again and again and again unceasing. I wanna hit joy's freak button to get all the way down and nasty with joy. Walk around smelling like joy just came all over my face and I couldn't get drunk on joy fast enough to catch it all. I want joy to stain my clothes. I want joy so delicious I mourn what spills onto the floor. So, so I serve myself another helping of joy. I want joy to want me to ask for me in the middle of the night, to choose me as the best cuddle buddy. I want joy to be fucking real, for joy to show up with a whole self. Teach me something about how to mend. Show me the best way to shine. Thank you for having me here. Oh, thank you so much, Amber, Amber <laughs> Flame. It was just stunning. And I, I just want to say, too, that we're just so grateful that you'll be able to read here tonight. And uh, also grateful that uh, Mike, who will be coming up, will be able to read here tonight as well. I want to just make a few announcements before we go into introducing Mike Van Nathken. Um, uh, the River Road Reading Series, which is, is a part of our literary experience here in Lane County, We'll be presenting uh, a reading on Zoom uh, the last Sunday of this month, March 28, from 4.30 to 6. And you can access them um, on, on the uh, internet. Gayat uh, Majumbar will be reading. Shandell Beers will be reading. And Hiram LaRue uh, will be reading as well. So there'll be three readers. And that's from 4.30 to 6. And again, as is the case of our own, 
series here. If you miss them, then you'll be able to access them on, on uh, the website, the River Road Reading Series website. So uh, also, I wanted to announce that <clears throat> Our, our two final uh, windfall series readings will be coming up in April and in May, April 20th, we'll have Erica Goss and Karen McPherson, uh, two wonderful poets. And on uh, May 18th, we'll have Judy Montgomery and Susan Moore and two more wonderful poets as well. So um, please uh, mark your calendars for those, those dates. And again, it will be at 6 p.m. Um, Pacific Daylight Time. I also want to put in a plug for our Tsunami books. We are so graced to have a wonderful literary bookstore here in town. This is their phone number. And uh, please do support them. They have been such a support to the Lane Literary Guild, providing space for our critique groups and um, also supplying space for our readers, um, people that are in the guild who have been doing readings as well. All right, well, I'll, <clears throat> I want to now announce Ma Mike Van Matkin. Um, and Mike uh, is a, uh, he's a preacher's kid from small town Iowa and a longtime resident of Eugene. He is an editor to the book trade and works with independent publishers and commercial houses like W.W. W. Norton and Hatshet, Hatshete. His fiction has appeared in everything from literary magazines to NPR. Mike will be reading from a recently completed novel called The Advanced Man. Set in the farm country of eastern Iowa, it tells the tale of a smooth-talking confidence man who gets sidetracked by love. Infused with humor, romance, and the touch of larceny, The Advanced Man is like Paper Moon or The Music Man, updated for the modern era. And uh, I just want to say I have been an admirer of, of Mike's work uh, for some time, and especially when he read for the River Road Reading series um, from this novel as well. He has a, an extraordinary vividness that he puts into his recreation of landscape. And I just want to read you an example of it from the work he'll be reading tonight. But I zoom toward the bridge, a steer girder contraption with a high arching lattice work that chopped the sunlight into rippled diamonds across the flat face of the Mississippi. And then I was flying over the water, expansion joints thunk a thunking, aimed at a collection of red big buildings that hugged the, west, the western riverbank. And so you have just a sense in that of exactly where we are in time and time and space, and also a lovely uh, visualization that's there. So uh, please welcome our reader, Mike Van Matkin. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Uh, Wendy and, and Amber Flame, man, that was just fantastic. And I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. And uh, thank you, everyone who's tuned in as well, um, supporting the arts. And there's a million choices out there, but I'm glad you're here with us. And um, that was a great introduction. I think he captured the, the story really well, kind of the essence of it. And so I thought I would um, uh, open with the first chapter because it, why not open with the first chapter? And it's a, kind of about new beginnings and also kind of new opportunities um, in a kind of a strange way. And so I think I'll just start and then see how it goes. So here we go. It goes like this. All right, chapter one. The Franklin spun, a silver blur whizzing on the bar top. Heads I win, tails you lose. The coin clipped a groove and old Ben wobbled like a clumsy drunk. And around and around it goes where it stops. The Franklin tripped on a seam and dropped with a clatter. We're dead on the spot. You win, you lose. If you try again, double or nothing. Another round there, champ. I considered the shimmering Franklin, the melting cubes of my tumbler, and the sweaty knave tattooed on the glass, one eyed jacks. I looked up at the barman, saw his pudgy spades gazing down with expectation at the coin. My heart silver for his illiquid gold. A few stools off, a pair of fathead farm boys were sizing me up with keen eyes and sharp teeth. Me a strange bird in bespoke suit clothes. Me alone at this lonely hour. Me a hapless trespasser, daring to dip his beak in the, the muddy watering hole. Didn't seem like a fair trade, I said to the barman, loud enough for the fathead boys to see her. I was down to this, my last coin, and thirsty as I always was, it was just too valuable to spend. 
barman harumphed, but he was curious enough to linger. A grunt confronted me from down the bar. Hell, just a 50 cent piece, ain't it? He said, if he did not, I admitted that it was, but it was special, astonishing and rare. A gift from my father-in-law on my wedding day back when. I tapped my bare rig finger at the act of an honest man, freely admitting his guilt. Promises made, promises broken, all bourbon and water under the bridge now. Rare how, the barman asked, disinterested in my busted drunkard's tail. Well, that was the question. I picked up the Franklin to consider it. My former father had been a tool and die man at the Denver Mint back in the mid 50s, a long two decades gone now. The coins were all silver in those days and proof strikes were simply resmelted, but not always. I held up the Franklin to admire the glisten of his frosted finish. Did they have another to compare? I waited his pockets were checked as a registered till was inspected. Nickels and dimes, quarters, a payday roll of greenbacks. No matter. It would seem I'd have to demonstrate. I invited the fathead boys in their payday roll to come a few stools closer. In an attempt to uh, improve the quality of the coinage, I explained, the Mint would test proposed modifications to the designs. Most never made it in circulation. This one certainly never had. I held around the Franklin as I gave them an up close look from the palm of my hand. Even in the dingy light, the details of this wonder of the Rockies were clear enough to see. Don't look nothing special. Exactly, but which way was Ben himself facing? They looked at each other as if it was a trick question. To the right, guess the fatter of the fedhead boys? Exactly, but which way should old Ben be facing? The trio thought long and hard without saying a word. The answer was right there in front of them, but it seemed too obvious to be correct. Uh, the other in way, the lesser fat had ventured. I set the coin down on the bar top with a solid click, a gesture to demonstrate the correctness of the answer and to suggest that Franklin was up for grabs. What's it worth, Barman said, cutting the chase. Coin this rare? No, it's hard to say precisely. At least a round of drinks for the whole bar, but only if the bar room was packed full of the entire bar itself was included. That had squinted at me, at each other, at the barman. They looked around the dead room to assess the value of the empty booths and the threadbare pool table, the blinkered jukebox and battered cigarette machine, the warm taps and dusty liquor bottles across the low back shelf. As they added up the value of these riches, I spun my tail. My ex-wife had taken me for absolutely everything down to the kitchen sink. All I had left were my nuts and this Hampton coin. I had a job to go up in Chicago at the commodities trading floor at the Mercantile, but I was stuck here between there and nowhere, just too broke to put enough gas in the tank, even to get me to Peoria. What I needed was a jump start. Even if the Franklin was worth a whole bar, I had sunk so low that I'd trade it for as little as a full tank in a motel room. The fatter the fathead boys gave me a shrewd look. Even fifty dollars for it. I took a long moment to weigh the offer of what it meant. On second thought, no. I couldn't it was the last memento of this happiest day of my life. It was my AA coin, too. Proof I could someday crawl out of the bottle for good. Proof I could still win her back. And I apologize for making my troubles their trouble and reach for the Franklin to claim it. 60, said the barman. I paused. 70, the fatter pet had countered. 80, the lesser pet had blurted. His rival kin smacked him upside the head. Shut up, dummy. 90, said the barman. The fatter pet had glared at his rivals. Tossed his payday roll onto the bar top. That's an even hundred. Cash on the barrel head. 150, said the barman. The fatter fed had raised up. It became a massive threat of violence that brushed back the barman and caused me to shrink. Here it's a deal, he said to me. You take that hundred dollar or a whoop your ass. He gulped on my fear and held steady as he savored his dominance. Since I couldn't take no for an answer, I gave the, gar the barman a courtesy of a helpless shrug. And I did the only reasonable thing I could and slid the coin down the bar top, and in return, took ownership of the greenbacks as I'd been commanded. Friends, I said, pushed off my stool. Many thanks for giving the stranger a helping hand that he most needed it. Guard that coin with great jealousy, and don't spend it all in one place. I'll be seeing you on the other side. As I shouldered out of the bar, I couldn't help but give a furtive glance back. The fat heads were huddled around the coin, sassing the barmen, and floating about the great fortune that was sure to come. And my heart warmed and I became glad. If nothing else, I had given them the fleeting pleasures of winning a king's ransom or song. Uh, the outside was sultry, the night liquid black and cloying. I retrieved my last good handkerchief. 
dotted the dampness from my forehead and moved the payday roll to the security of my wallet, checked my watch and the splash of piss gold neon that tattled the champagne of beers. The hour was small, the night was long, but I dared no rest. The day ahead had already begun and I could count on nothing except for the luster of the coin to suddenly tarnish. Traveling slicks in the farm country or sore thumbs easily struck and the spell I'd cast over the Franklin was both fickle and charged. You know, my car beckoned from the far end of the gravel lot, shadowing under a marquee that promised a friendly welcome to the Sugar Bottom Motor Lodge. The soft light spilling from the marquee stained the gravel, bled out across the strip of blacktop and dissolved to do cornfield slather with tendrils of congealing fog. I didn't like the shape of the layout, the feel of my place in it, and as slow as my breaths, the sensation of lurking danger came over me. The room I'd gotten early that evening was an indulgence I should not have afforded myself in the story of my life. I felt a tug and urge to forgo the extravagance of clean sheets and soft pillows, to brace myself with a cold, hard shower, to pack up and get lost, to find a lonesome stretch of back road where I could crash sleep, but he catch a few foot of the wings. Now, gravel stones stuck into my thin leather soles as I crunched across the parking lot. Playing yokels for chump change was the only thing keeping me afloat these days. For too many months, it's no good purpose. I've been sailing through this miserable patch of Western Illinois, hunting for whales in this tall corn country of blighted towns, hung with uninspired names conjured by folks too thrifty for even the luxury of poetic fancy. Hills, black rock, plains. Now, no matter how colorful my yarns, how simple my pattern, how easy my terms, now the hands stay jammed in overall pockets to pinch the pennies found there. My only possessions of enduring value was a gold watch and lighter, a match set given to me as a no hold far, no hold, no hard feelings part and gift by a group of bankers in Ohio after they bullied me out of a fortune of stock in Utah copper mine of rather mythical value. My other prize was a triple black 67 Lincoln Continental convertible, pure class with suicide doors that I'd earned in trade at the height of the spring cabin season. A jolly dairyman in Indiana had given it up for an outstanding portion of a wholesale feed franchise and sold it with a sweet distribution kickback and self a complicated deal built on a pyramid of easy terms and the prospect of fabulous profits. Business is business, but I'm an honorable man. I merely tell tales of uncommon opportunity and trade for common currency, a line no different than selling tickets to an adventure of flickering light on a silver screen. I made quiet entry into my motel room, stripped down, showered in a spray so cold that it set my teeth chattering and turned my cheeks rosy. Honed to a cutting sharpness, I dried off and dressed, packed my suitcase. A check of wallet and watch and keys confirmed all was in place. Squared and ready, I eased out of the motel room. The lock clicked behind me, and there on the promenade, I again tested the feel of the moment and my place in it. The danger was still lurking. I could feel it in my tingling fingers and my squeezy throat. The black night had turned into definite gray and the smolder of the coming sunrise had made out the contours of the vehicles nosed up to the rooms. A do damp family station wagon, the dark wing of my top down continental, a creamy crew van a few doors down. I sensed something like rushing wind far away and I cocked my ear to catch it. The wind gathered, became the hissing of tires on blacktop coming fast. The urge to run was sudden, immediate, and I hurried past the dark windows to the promenade, reached my convertible, tossed a suitcase in the back and ducked for cover. Worn brace grasped on gravel uh, under soft tires. I hugged the shadows as kilted headlights swept across the face of the motel like floodlights searching for an escaped prisoner. An engine brattled closer, cough dead suburb of Tastaku van, leaf springs groaned, stomping boots spilled out, unpunctuated shotgun shuck, loud sloppy voices roared for the dirty dog to come out like a man and get his ass whipping. Lights popped out of the windows down the other rooms, all the way to the manager's office. Me fists clubbed the heavy door. Hunched at the back bumper, I dared to steal a look. A rotted up pickup doors flung wide. The hook backsides of two fat-headed farm boys, a gleaming gun barrel. Undoubtedly, they dug up another prank to compare it to the prize. And alas, Ben only favor faces to the right. The spell can break any which way. And this one had broken with the thunder of drunken rage. Slapping feet smacked concrete coming fast. Pajama closed billow and the swollen faced manager stormed past on the promenade, hurling God damn it's like thunderbolt, thunderbolts. I fished my keys, slithered for the driver's door. Kaboom! Splitting wood and crashing bodies blundered to my former motel room. I froze up inside, but my body was in motion now. 
hunkered down, I popped the door, crawled in, plugged the key into the ignition, pumped the gas, twisted the key. The engine spun up, smooth and strong against the cold start. Resisting the urge to mash my foot to the floorboards, I slid the vessel back from her berth, clicked through the drive, and crept away, steady as a held breath, the slow sunrise. My gaze fixed in the rear view, and the narrow rectangle reflected shifting shapes of bodies locked in struggle. Cautious under spilling knee, and I bumped onto the blacktop. A muffled breeze became a gentle wind, then a roaring gale. The road ahead was a dim slash through open fields, and I drove hard to gain distance, checking the rear view with the obsession of a hunted man. But the road and furrow behind me emptied to be. The brake felt clean, and as my nerves settled, I eased down to illegal speed and began to lose myself on lonely back roads, drifting westward, if only for the growing sun to keep the growing sun out of my eyes and the path ahead bright and clear. My instincts had been right, and they saved me. The other story of my life. Swaying oceans of field crops lifted and fell like rolling waves. Islands of hardwood trees crowded lone farmhouses with narrow windows drawn tight and blind to the outside world. Fat red barns hunched beside muddy pens with doleful stock. I took in scraggly farm towns with one eye full and just as quickly discarded them. The roads between empty, save for a smattering of lilting tractors and dented pickups with balding retreads. I lapsed into a driver's trance, and for a weird spellbound moment, I saw my face floating ghost-like in the dirty windshield. The road crested a hill, and as the weight of me escaped my body and squeezed back in again, I found myself flowing downward toward a bridge that spanned a mighty river so vast and awesome that it eased off the gas in the wonder of it. I zoomed toward the bridge, a steel girder contraption with a high arching latticework that chopped the sunlight into rippled diamonds across the, the flat face of the Mississippi. And then I was flying over the water, expansion joints thunk, the thunk, the thunking aimed at a collection of red brick buildings that hugged the western riverbank in downtown. From it, a steep slope lifted to the rock-faced bluff at the top of spreading trees and a line of handsome homes bathed in bright sunlight. The rusted signs bolted to the bridge girders marked the state line and welcomed me to Iowa, a place to grow, in a town christened with an industrious name, Millerton. Once clear of the bridge, the road splintered. The way ahead on a lifted on a low grade westward out of town through a neighborhood of humble homes packed in close. The flat rooftops of the downtown building stood below me to the left. Narrow streets spurred off to the right, climbed the steep slope and disappeared into a residential district on the bluff above. An impulse I turned right. The straining, short pitch delivered me into a flat shaded world of broad lawns and flowering bushes, of ambitious houses with dramatic roof lines and rotund turrets and wrapping porches. The drone of a distant lawnmower blended with humming tires as the pavement gave way to rough brick. Stout men folk were out and about, spraying windows with garden hoses and washing cars and soapy driveways. Ladies in starched aprons clipped flowers and worked clotheslines. The gang of boys paused to ball game to regard me, their faces etched with the suspicion reserved for sizing up an outsider. Now, because looks are deceiving, I withheld my assessments of the town as I glided out of the shady streets and coasted into the downtown grid. I felt the gnaw of hunger as I descended, and I decided to look for a diner, the sort of place where locals gathered to gossip and a stranger like me might get an accurate fix on the quality of his welcome. The downtown tilted on a slight incline toward the river. The flat top building stood a square three stories, and up close I saw brick faces worn and weathered. Dusty storefronts displayed durable wares faded by too many days under the glare of a strong sun. Clothing and shoes, housewares and appliances, musical instruments and caskets. The streets, potholed and shot through with cracks, were framed by chipped stone curbs. Broken sidewalks carried light foot traffic, men with lazy steps trailing women with clutched purse and tent. Their bearing was a curious mix of indolence and diligence, health and ailment. But unlike the crumbling coal and factory towns of the Rust Bucket East, the air here wasn't tainted with the grimy funk, and though the folk of Millicent seemed a bit threadbare, well, they were polished up and dignified. I pulled to the curb, shut off the engine, sat tall and conspicuous. The passing folk acknowledged me with concise nods and thin smiles to a stranger. Encouraged, I stepped out to join the ranks. Following my nose, around a corner, I found my diner, the paddle wheel. A scratchy cartoon filled the 
plate glass window and it invited me to enter into an oldie timey dining experience aboard the Zebby Line. Heavy glass doors pushed easy, my entrance announcing, announced by a tinkling bell, and I found myself in the invitation of an, an, an antebellum steamboat, complete with bulbous fixtures and ornately framed photographs and paintings, long stacked paddle wheelers churning heroically upriver, bent back men and beasts loading cotton bales, gambling men in flat brimmed hats applying the rascal trade. Despite the fanfare, business was slow. In a far booth, a trio of thick-handed farmers huddled over coffee, napkins tucked into their collars to safeguard their talent clean overalls. At a near table, a professional man studied the financial pages of a big city newspaper while munching toast and absently tapping ash, a loosened tie flipped over his shoulder. A lone waitress who had perfected the craft of lingering drifted about in a smart pink uniform with crisp white accents. She gave me a permissive nod that showed me to a stool at the counter and set me up with a scalding cup of joe as thick as pitch tar. While savoring the clingy aromas coming from the kitchen, I blew on the coffee with polite airs and allowed myself a wandering gaze, touching eyes with my fellow patrons and receiving in-kind regard. I found my lighter and pack. The old gear started clicking as I tapped them loose. Well, I could play the lone professional with some certificates of stock and a sure bet copper miner. Maybe I could play the farmer trio with the wonders of a rare coin. Neither felt right. Now the waitress, waitress drifted back to me, refilled my cup to the brim. Morning, hon. What kind of meat you want? Uh, not having opened the menu, I replied with a sunny smile and ordered up the day special, a fortifying platter of hams and eggs and hash browns. As she eased over to the kitchen window to put my order up, my eyes lifted to the pictures of the dandy gambling men. Their dirty dealings made romantic by the long days of history. And it occurred to me that I've been playing the wrong games at the wrong tables. Rare coin from coin franchises. Small stakes games that put a man on the run. This thin wallet becoming thinner with every blue plate and empty tank. I needed to change my ways. I needed to become like the gambling men of yore. A celebrity with a common man's touch. A man you're sure you know and sure you like. A Friend you admire so much you laid down your last dollar just for a chance to buy a drink. You know, the measure of a man is described by how earnestly he applies himself to the excellence of his trade and how ably he marshals the what he makes. You're making myself whole cloth, meant to engaging in the arts of wholesale fabrication. And as my luck would have it, I chanced into Millerton, a bygone place holding its own even as, as it was fading away a place of easy nods and simple smiles, a place of farmers in clean overalls and waitresses smart and pink. Yes, indeed, Middleton was swell, a place where a man could press himself into the labors of his trade, and if his luck was any good, earn himself a tidy fortune. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it uh, for an opportunity to read to you. Thank you. That was great, Mike. Uh, Thank you. Very riveting, and uh, you've got a big finger going there, that's for sure. And it's uh, very, thank you. Yeah, it's very vivid. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay, well, we're, we're now into our question and answer period, and we encourage you to write in uh, any questions that have come up. We have one already for, for Flame. Um, comes from a man, my friend, Amanda Powell. Um, she says, uh, she asks, what is the formal element of the Vanguard series? Is this something you learned in writing a poem or some, something that you didn't know before it was written? Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, it came, came about because I was working on a really hard piece that I was trying to figure out what angle I was taking. And I sort of, I took an angle to editing that I've never taken before, which is like get the idea down and sort of brain map it out, almost like a project or something. I'd never done that with a poem. And I was just, it just was a really hard subject to tackle for me emotionally. And I wasn't ready, but I had the ideas. So I'd sort of just brain map them out. And as I was trying to bring them into poem form, it was sort of like this one and then this one and then this one. And I realized that I actually had, um, sort of an introductory poem that went with, and, and none of them were quite complete without the others. So it felt like it told the whole story when you hear them all. It told yeah. 
everything I wanted to everything I wanted to say about that piece. It was it was in all four of the pieces, and uh -huh. it started with this sort of vanguard, the setup poem. And then I mean, I I thought maybe I would only do it once, but then it ended up being the way that the Aretha poem came about, and then another poem, you know, the poem about my mother. There's actually two. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it was organic, and now it's formalized. Yeah. Now I've done it a few times. <laughs> yeah. I thought very effective because it gets a momentum going. It's just really quite wonderful. That's great. Um, uh, Wendy, do you have another question, or shall I just go on with my my question here? Do I didn't get anybody in my email? They felt okay. bold enough right. to guess online. I want to I want to ask Mike. Um, what particularly fascinates you about the con man or the trickster element um, in people? Um, have you felt the interest in that for a long time? I know it's fascinated many writers, you know, even right going all the way back to Herman Millville. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I just find it's a really fascinating character type. You can do so much with it. And that the trickster character, like you said, is so classic that, you know, it's just, so much you can do with it and the i think the question is you know what maybe it's something you can do new with it i don't know i mean it's just uh -huh. i find voice with it and that's great it's a fun story anyway i i, uh -huh. I, I, I don't know i i, I want to ask you in follow-up to that a little bit of a loaded question because it, it, yeah. it indicates a prejudice on my part but when i was we're writing about the southern midwest and specifically arkansas um I, I wrote about a man who, who convinced himself and everybody he could cure cancer back in the, in the 1930s, <laughs> Norman Baker. And he even set up a little hospital um, yeah. down near Eureka Springs. But this is a loaded question and it probably has a prejudice in it. But do you think that the trickster element provides a certain window into the Midwest? I mean, or, I mean could this take place in Canada, could it be, take place, uh, you know, in the specific Northwest? I mean, or, or is there some yeah. thing at all? I hear what, you, I hear what you're saying. I, I think there's a trusting element, the kind of Midwest sensibility of it in my experience with it. And it makes it sort of an, kind of easy marks, almost too easy, you know, and so you can pass yourself uh -huh. off. Yes. You say who you are and people kind of believe it. And I, I think it's about the, the size of the lie. I mean, most people don't tell the big lie. And so, um, Maybe a little lies during out today. People know that, and so if you ask a tell a small lie, people recognize it. But if you tell a big lie, yeah. that like who does that? You know, so it's, it's got to be real, you know. Uh -huh. And you can pull a fast one. And there there are some great stories of Midwestern uh, confidence man uh, stories that are incredible. Um, I, I encourage you to look them up. They're amazing. And um, so and perhaps so. Good. I just great. seems right for that. Seems right for that kind of character type. I think. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Um, Flame, I wanted to ask you, um, it's, there's a lot of interconnection of emotions, sometimes surprising, um, and I, I noticed in your writing and, and in what you said that there's a kind of an interconnection between grief and creativity and even grief and joy. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, it's joyful grief or... Uh, creative grief or yeah um, I, my work um, most of my teaching at this point is exploring that very thing I, I use I use a play on a Bible verse um, and I call my workshop there's joy in the morning m-o-u-r-n-i-n-g um, instead of there's joy in the morning um, uh, because I think that that is what the journey of, of grief and loss has taken me on is that it can deepen your appreciation of being here, even when I'm depressed, <laughs> even when I'm like, why yeah. am I still here? You know, like there's yeah. there's something about staying alive that that is inherently joyful. There's there's an opportunity for something to change. And I think that's what we have to embrace as we step into a, the collective mourning that's going to occur as a, a, a whiplash of this pandemic of, of yeah. the quarantine of, of so many so many human lives lost um, in such a short period of time, we are under, we're, we're in mourning and we don't even know it because we're still in shock. And so nice. as I step into more grief work, I, I have to find where to be joyful 
because mm -hmm. that is the only reason we're here. <laughs> the only mm -hmm. reason why we create the only is to access the the lifeness, the the being aliveness that is mm -hmm. left to us um, for our, however long it's left. We don't know. There's a, you know tomorrow is not promised. I can I, I bet Mike and I could go back on Bible verses, <laughs> back and forth on Bible verses for a while. Um, but yes, there's just like. It, it, it came upon me one day. I was like, maybe joy isn't these big, sparkly, um, brilliant flashes and moments in life. Maybe it is just in simple moments that just you have to be paying attention. You have to notice them. You have to decide to be alive um, or you'll miss it. Um, exploring actually Whitney Houston's death um, and, and really going into her life and, and how she escaped into drug addiction and all this stuff. Like as I impacted, I realized I was like, oh, she was, she was like a joy seeker. She was hungry to try to find a way to feel joyous again. And it recalled my, my guru who passed right after my mother did. She always told me to learn what, what, to learn what feeds my joy to step into what feeds my joy. And I was always like, what does that mean? I, how do you, what, I, what does that mean? And I thought that that was the purpose. But what she was actually telling me, it turns out, was that there are all these moments in life that just kind of skim by and they're just little, they're little blips of, of, of a sparkle here or a smile there or a true connection. And, and, and that is it. That might be all there is. It might be a lot of heaviness and that's all there is. So if you can't notice those moments, then then you're not you're not staying a lot, you're not staying present yeah. and, and you're just running yeah. after something that is really an illusion at that point, right? Joy yeah. it becomes an illusion. So um I I I have to keep them tied together because otherwise I'll I'll drown. <laughs> it's easy to drown in grief. It's easy to drown in what how awful you know, this, this book I'm writing explores that, like the world is a trash fire half the time. Um, you look around and you're just depressed about it. So, but did you, did you like look at your child and smile today? Or did you have yeah. something really, um, did you notice spring coming? That's been, you know, that's been my source of joy recently is like, oh, there's a bud right there and it's about to open. And just, that's it. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's all I'll get. But isn't that enough? Isn't that why I'm here? Anyway, yeah, yeah. it's a question I keep asking myself yeah. more than an answer. <laughs> and, and not taking anything for granted, you know. Exactly. Like, you know what I mean? Um, Including yeah. the opportunity to be alive right now, which is yes. as hard as it is. And I've heard people say that already now about how much the spring means to them this time around, you know, mm -hmm. after COVID, uh, all that too. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It's interesting because I that the song I want to dance with somebody who loves me, that's got a melancholy aspect to it. Oh, too. it's so sad. Yeah, mm -hmm. but there's the joy too. Where what you know what I mean? It's that it's well, of course you know what I mean. Maybe it's just that conjunction, you know? Yeah, I mean be, the the knowing that you could maybe yes. find somebody to dance with, yes. somebody who loves me. Yes. Somebody who's here just for me, only yes. for me, right. yeah. you know, like, like, how could you not, like, she has a smile on her face, even as she's longing for something more, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. And if she had been able to notice that that's it, that's all. Um, yeah. The fact that you're alive to want to dance. To want the fact it. that your yeah. body still dances. Yeah. You know, how, how wonderful is that? That is great. Oh, that's great. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, uh, Mike, about how you decide in the first, this, again, I don't know why I keep asking you these loaded questions, <laughs> but, <anyway. laughs> but how you decide um, what to suppress in an opening chapter in terms of backstory and what you you decide to disclose. Now, I, I may be missing something, but I don't think we know his name yet, right? Is Not yet. Right? Okay, we don't know his name. And we really don't know what he looks like. Uh, we yeah. can guess a little bit like a little bit of his age. So yeah. um, tell me a little bit about this mystery that you're obviously you could have done all of that, but yeah. tell me a little bit about this mystery and your well, decision to keep that. Well, thanks for asking. Yeah, it's um the part that I presented to half the half the book, there's a whole another voice that is a counterpoint to this, and he's he's described from another point of view. 
And okay, so there's another narrator in the in the novel. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that and that's the foil who's also so he's the villain, and so the heroine is the the one who describes him and and uh, illustrates you know reveals the truth of who he is, and he's delusional himself, so he doesn't really recognize who he is. He's false at the same time he's true to himself, and the other character, the counterpoint, sees him for who he is right through him and takes him to task. And so he's described thoroughly and completely that way. So it's a point counterpoint, uh, kind of not a he said, she said, but more of a just a tennis match back and forth between both of them. And so it, it becomes a reveal um, through her, her point of view um, as much as much as through his. So he doesn't describe himself, but he describes everything else except himself. And he's revealed again by others. So okay. again, I only had 20 minutes. And so I, you know, oh, yeah. it's a whole, whole, whole other voice. That, know, yeah, well, we didn't want to want, have to do War and Peace in 20 minutes. So, <laughs> but, uh, so you said she, so this is another, yeah. the other narrator is a she. Yeah. And that's the only other narrator in the book. That's right. Okay. And, and she is reliable, whereas he is not. Is that right? That's exactly right. Yeah, she's completely stalwart and totally reliable and very practical and Absolutely square. That's right. Um, so she's sort of a representation of this place that he's landed into, the authentic, true, true place. And so he's there to, you know, cause trouble. And so she's yeah. there to stop him. You know, from a, okay. A, it's, it's different work. And so, There's yeah. A counter, in a kind of counterpoint that's going on. Absolutely. In, yeah. Very yeah. good. And I thought about bringing that out too, but I thought, oh, that's just kind of too well, much. That, yeah. You only had the first nine pages, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Um, you do this, and this this question comes from Karen McPherson, who actually will be reading uh, her poetry next month. She has also been a windfall coordinator, and she says, uh, "Amber and Mike, wonderful readings and discussion. One little question for for uh, Amber Flame: fruits and vegetables. Anything more about this? <laughs> By the way, I love the avocado." <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a couple. Some of my, my more light poems I, I feel in the collection are about fruits and, and or vegetables. Um, I, I have a thing for fruits and vegetables. I'm the kind of person who finds a really good, you know, fruit and vegetable stand and then does too much. Like there's no way you're possibly going to consume all these fruits and vegetables before they go bad kind of thing. But I can't resist because they're gorgeous and they smell good and they look so pretty. And I'm like a little bit of this and I can't contain myself. It's like office supplies and fruits and vegetables for me. Um, so I don't know if you're a collector of fruits and vegetables. Some people do books. I tend to read my books, um, but fruits and vegetables always got me and they'd always bothered me every time they one would just I wouldn't get to it it would it, when, when throwing out fruits and vegetables saddens me makes me you know and they stick with me um so I have a poem about a plum um I have a poem about avocados I'm working on some more about and and just when they come to me and it's usually an experience where it's like I just recently lost a mango to time <laughs> and it makes me so sad because it, like there's something so luxuriant um poems about office, no poems about office supplies yet but now that i mention it right it's just a more more place to explore um yeah so fruits and vegetables i think they're an easy metaphor for me of of just how you know when you have something that you just delight in but then you don't give it to yourself you withhold it. I think that's something that I'm I'm picking at. Like, why don't we just, you know, why don't I just eat it instead of being like, oh, I'm going to save it. I'm going to have a salad. I'm going to have a big salad. It's going to be great. It's like, or you're going to have no salad because it's all bad. <laughs> you know. So um, I, I think that's where I find a, I think it's a lighter way to look at how we, how we are haunted by the mundane. Yeah. How we're haunted by the mundane. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not just not just the big things, but little things. Yeah, yeah. I have a kind of a complex about zucchini mm. uh, because in Idaho, y you just barely put the seed over the ground, and it's you know, <laughs> like a water balloon. You know what I mean when you're filling a water balloon, and you know somebody go up to you and say, um, "Well, I have some vegetables to give," and they look at you suspiciously and they'd say, "What kind?" Because <laughs> everybody was loaded with now and, and 
here in Oregon, my husband and I cannot grow a zucchini in our backyard to save our mm -hmm. lives. They just dry up and die. And wow. I've just felt so inferior because of that. You know, and, and <laughs> I just, you know, it's interesting how we can rivet our attention. You know what I mean? So Yeah. I also yeah. grew up in the desert. So moving to the Pacific Northwest was like, there just was so many. There's so many options for fruit and vegetables. Just growing on the ground, like blackberries, just... Somebody moved back to to the Southwest and was like, "Oh my gosh! For the first time in ten years, I've I paid for blackberries. What, <laughs> what life is this?" And it's like, right? I remember that life. So I have a special fondness and appreciation for things that grow. Just yeah, and that how disappointing your zucchinis won't grow. You'd think Oregon was wet enough for that. Uh, it's well, some of our neighbors do just fine with it, so I don't know. Oh. But we just we stick we stick now with dahlias. So. <laughs> Love Which are also beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, just a couple of final questions, and one for Mike, and that is, did did this character, What can you reveal his name so I can speak about Can you tell me his name? Yeah, his name is Bam Parsons. Bam? Bam Parsons, yeah. Bam. A ridiculous name. Did, yeah. did Bam, Bam, for you, as you were writing about him, evolve over time, or did he stay pretty much the same character? No, he evolved. It was really interesting. Thanks for asking. His voice really changed as the more, more I uh, wrote him, the easier it got, you know? And in fact, the first chapter was the last chapter I wrote um, because I really didn't work. I wrote it, but it didn't really fit, didn't really work well. And once I had the book finished, uh, I found that I could write the opening, which is what I just read. Um, so yeah, he really did change. And the, the character himself, I think, became more gentle, became more uh, uh, aware of himself as it went along, which I thought was interesting too. Yes. Uh, that wasn't necessarily what was going to be the case at all. And yeah. uh, I, it, was, it was more interesting that way too. It, it's a process, right? The writing process reveals. Definitely, that. yeah. You know, there's that wonderful story about Tolstoy who went be before he started Anna Karenina, he was going to write this kind of scathing satire about this wicked woman. And as he wrote more and more, and it grew to be about 900 pages um, in print, he, he became so in love with her and with her tragic resonance and her yeah. beauty. Um, it, 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 is, it is wonderful sort of how characters can, um, if we don't hold them back, evolve yeah. into yeah. That's, that's right. right. And I, he, he becomes kinder, I think, to himself and other people. And I think that was interesting, oh, too. And, good. and you know, perhaps it was when I was writing, when I was finishing up, because it was kind of in this time of lockdown. And I don't know, it became more gentle, more forgiving, I think. And it was right. uh, it felt right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mike, can I ask you, do, sure. do you start out with, uh, with um, is, it, is it easier, do you feel, to start with sort of like set extremes of sorts like okay this character is going to hold this this Deep. round and then they kind of deepen right like they that's right. like you said they they evolve all yeah, by that's themselves right. yeah that's the point counterpoint and that's right and the set them in, in dire opposition and the more in opposition they are the more interesting the reactions are when they collide and so if you have a trusting town folk or a gentle place that sort of is getting along and you've got someone who comes to the mix is going to turn it up then you've got something interesting i think and that's right. And uh, um, yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, the, the more black and white it is, the more um, up and down it is, the, you know, the better, for sure. But then they get gray on their own, it sounds like. They, they become yeah. more complex all by themselves. That's right. Yeah, cool. that's right. And, and Yeah, exactly. So th they surprise themselves. And, th and they surprise me when I do it, too. And it's a lot of fun. So it's just a, it's a pleasure to work on this kind of thing. Oh, I can't wait to learn about the stalwart one who probably oh, is less stalwart than she thinks. <laughs> Thanks. One last question for Flame. Um, you mentioned a best self when you were reading the poetry, a best self. And it makes me think of uh, Alice Walker when she was being interviewed and, and she said she loved writing about people who we're pursuing their best self. And I don't think I'll ever forget that as far as, you know, my own writing is concerned. And I wondered, does, uh, how does that phrase work with you when you're, you're writing about the best self? 
Oh man, that goes back to the whole why we're here, right? The joy. Um, I always, I always say that I'm, I'm trying. I keep trying to, to be my best, the best version of myself that I can be. That's every day that I'm here. I'm trying to be a better version of myself um, in the way that I show up for my child, in the way that I show up for my relationships, my work, everything. Um, I think that. It's it's it it's pretty boring when people think that they're okay just as they are. <laughs> it's a pretty static life um, to just be like, no, I'm I'm good the way I am, the way I think, the way you know the people I'm surrounded by. I don't I don't need to challenge that. Um, I would be bored to tears if I wasn't sure that I had more work to do on myself. <laughs> essentially, uh, to really arrive here, to show up here, and it's not it's you know. Um, it's, it's trying to show up with my best self. And another thing that comes up a lot in my, in my thoughts and my teaching is this embracing of the, and like, I am trying to be the best mother that I possibly can be. And there are days when I just don't have it in me and I fail. Um, and so the, the this big, and is in the middle of everything instead of, but, or should, or could it's, it's just, and, um, and that the best self is one that is really that moves with grace through the ends of life, that there are, there are days when you can show up and you can be like, I conquered that day and I was a great person to everybody I encountered and, you know, just really knocked it out of the park today. And, and, <laughs> and there are days when you will not, and that's okay too. Um, that's, that's, that's the journey. That's the experience of being human. Um, so the best self is, is um, my moral compass. It is what replaces, I'm not a church kid anymore. I don't have the same beliefs anymore, but that, that sense of like, you know, I think it comes from that, definitely that, that yeah. idea that you're going to be measured at the end of your life yes. by your deeds, right? By your actions, right. your deeds, your words. And so what, what do mine look like? Would I be pleased with the legacy I leave behind? Tying it back to Prince, you know, Prince was um, in his memoir, he says something like, um, begin with yourself, create the you you want to be every day. And, and just like each day arrive to the, the you you want to be. And yeah. his is maybe not best self, <laughs> but if the best self I want to show up to every day is, is my reality, then, then isn't that the biggest creative freedom to be like, I can be a new, yes. better version of myself every day. Right. And, you know, other people might not always see it, but I can see it. <laughs> and if I can see it, then I have a reason to keep trying. That's wonderful. Yes. Well, thank you both so much. It's been such a rich experience here tonight hearing uh, you know, the prose and the poetry. And I'm looking forward to reading more of both of you. Yes, absolutely. It's such a, such so a great, great thank launch. Yeah. We can't wait to have it at the library, too. All of your work. Awesome. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And putting it on the shelf. So thank you so much, both of you. Thanks. Yes. And thank and, you, Henry. And remember um, also for our next reading, uh, we, we'll be on April 20th with Erica Goss and Karen McPherson. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, thanks for a wonderful time tonight, both of you. And thanks, Wendy, for hosting. Yes, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one, y'all. Good night. Thank you.